Hey, I hope everybody had a good day. This is a, I gotta tell you, I was just talking to some Chiefs right here in the front row in the second section here. I talked about what an unenviable position it is to follow Lieutenant General Jim Slife and try to pass on some brilliance after that and then get followed up by my peers in the Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force. That's, that's a pretty unenviable place to be. So I'll do my best. What should I come up with? Hmm. Hey, what's my video? Do you guys like the video? I heard they played the video in front of uh, Chief McGee's briefing. No? It, was, it got cut short? All right, so friend me on Facebook, look at my page, 23rd November or so, I think is when we put that on there, you can check it out, it's pretty good. Um, I'm a dog person. Any dog people out here? Got some dogs, got some dogs over here, dog people. How about cat people? Are there cat people here? There's some people proud enough to go, yeah, I'm a cat person. <laughs> Two cat people, everybody else dog people. I'm a dog person too. Um, and I've come to believe, after all my years of owning dogs, that there are four kinds of dogs out there. The first kind of dog is a lap dog. That's the kind of dogs I have. I have two little Yorkies, you know, less than 10 pounds a piece. I love those dogs, man. But they're lap dogs, and lap dogs, what do lap dogs do? They yip, they want attention. They want attention, look at me, I want to be in the spotlight. Pay attention to me, feed me, love me. I want to be on your lap. I want all the attention, I want to get in your spotlight. You know, as Lieutenant General Jim Slife might say. That's lap dogs. The second kind of dog is a road dog. Road dogs are just kind of out there, head down, walking down the road. They don't have anywhere to be. They're not going anywhere. Certainly not concerned with time and the clock. They're just walking down the road. Road dogging it. <laughs> the third kind of dog is a yard dog. Anybody got yard dogs? They're out there in the yard and they're protecting the yard, right? Isn't that what yard dogs do? Don't come in here. Do not come in here. This is my yard. You're not coming in here, and you know what? I'm not going out there. I'm going to stay right here, and I'm protecting this yard. That's what I do. I'm a yard dog. And the fourth kind of dog is a hound dog. Hound dogs, well, they're kind of the opposite of road dogs. They're highly trained. They're using all their senses. Heads up, with purpose. I'm seeking out problems. I'm solving things. I'm hound dogging. And that's how I'm happy, is if I'm hound dogging. I think there's four kinds of chiefs in the United States Air Force. <laughs> Do you know any lap dog chiefs? You might. You know, you know some road dogs? You know, we got a retirement on active duty acronym for road dogs, don't we? They exist. They're out there. Yard dogs sometimes want to think of themselves like hound dogs, but they're just yard dogs in the end. They have yard dog tendencies and I'm just protecting my yard. I'm a chief. I'm going to protect my little area here. That's what I do. I'm going to stay here. and That's what I do. That's what chiefs do. No. Hound dogs. Hound dogs is what we need. If you spent 72 hours here in this room getting advice from people like Lieutenant General Jim Slife, all my peers here up front, the Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force, and you're asking yourself probably right now, what am I going to do with all this stuff? It's time to hound dog. Get off the X, get active, write down three things and say, hey, I want to get better at these three things. I want to know more about this. I want to read this. I want to advance my skills on this. And this chief right here next to me, my spouse, my friend, my mom or dad, they're going to make sure that I execute this list. That's what hound dogs do. Ted Lasso says be a goldfish. I'm asking you to go be a hound dog. Thanks, everybody. It's been great to spend time with you. And now I get to be in the unenviable, unenviable position of following the command chief of all of ACC, the hound dog, Dave Wade. Uh, I'll just share with you something really quick. Uh, you know, there's 
There's probably a hundred different uh, pieces of advice that you've gotten this week. Uh, I'll give you this one in case you haven't gotten it yet. Uh, is Lud still here, Chief of the Chiefs group, or did Lud? He bounced out, lucky guy. He, he probably got out the heck out of here as quick as he could because he knows all you guys want to bum rush him still. Uh, but but Lud, Lud gets a lot of phone calls. Uh, he gets a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people got great ideas and things about where they should go. But one of the phone calls that Lud gets is, is hey, uh, hey, we got to... We got to make a change, you know, kind of a, a something that might not be expected, right? And he gets these calls probably a little bit more often than you, than you might believe, right? So uh, I've just got a couple pieces of advice for you. The first one is, uh, you know, you just got a, a great example from an awesome commander here of someone who you could probably right now be like, hey, I want to work for that guy, right? You probably go work for General Slife like tomorrow. Uh, I've known him for several years. I feel the exact same way. You might right now, though, be working for somebody that you're like, whew, man, this is a tough one, right? Uh, and you might be in a situation where that inspiration isn't there, that connection's not there. Uh, maybe you've just got like a personality conflict or, uh, you know, you just don't kind of agree with the way that the organization's going. And that's okay. That's, that's going to happen from time to time. But it's your responsibility to make the adjustments that you need to make in that situation to make sure that you're supporting not just your commander, but the people in your unit, right? That's your responsibility as their chief. Now, it's not your responsibility to help them commit crimes or do immoral things or things like that. That's where the chief part comes in. You stand up and say, uh-uh. You know, you close the door first, uh, and you give them that honest feedback. So lots of phone calls that Lud gets on maybe making a, a, a chief move. And a lot of times, it's just that. It's, hey, we've tried to kind of work this out, and it's not working. So the phone call goes something like this. Hey, I got a chief, X location, no other jobs for them to do, can't get along with the commander. Uh, can we figure out something to do to move this chief on? The end of the conversation doesn't sound like this. Hey, Lud, could you call over to the colonel's group and see if maybe we could move that commander to another position? right? You will lose this every single time and twice on Sundays, all right, folks? We don't move commanders because they can't get along with their chief, all right? So don't forget little things like that. It's going to be really easy over the next, you know, few months. You may be feeling it already, you know, to kind of feel like you're bulletproof and, you know, you can kind of step out and, you know, start doing some things that, uh, that maybe you couldn't do as a senior, uh, and, and that's good. I, I'm, I want you to have that and, and don't lose that, but, but keep the focus of where you are, who you are, and what your responsibilities are to your unit. Because you could go take your flag and run with it right off the cliff, and then who are you helping? Nobody. You're not going to be there to help those airmen. You're not going to be there to be that sounding board, that voice of reason for that commander that might be a young, struggling officer themselves that, that is looking for some guidance too, right? Uh, and it's your responsibility to make sure that they can do the best job possible for our folks. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. You don't have anything left to do but run around and help as many people as you possibly can, and I hope you're ready to go do that. So thanks a lot. Jeez. Chiefs! Chiefs! When we created the grade of Chief Master Sergeant, when Congress was arguing to pass the law that created the grade of Chief Master Sergeant, Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson from the state of Texas stated that the reason we needed a Chief Master Sergeant in the United States Air Force was to create a completely combat competent and capable leader for the airmen of the greatest Air Force in the world. What has changed? Has anything changed since then when Senator Lyndon B. Johnson argued that the reason we, had, we needed chiefs was to create combat, competent, and capable leaders for the greatest Air Force that has ever existed? I would say that nothing has changed. If anything, we need you now more than ever. We are not going to fight the war we fought 20 years ago, 20 years from now. 
those of us in the front row up here are going to be gone. In fact, we're going to be on the porch drinking whiskey, throwing rocks at you guys, going, get off my lawn, airmen. You are going to lead our airmen into the future. So I will get off the stage by saying, A, thank you very much for your service. B, congratulations on the opportunities that you are going to have to serve into the future. And congratulations on being the highest enlisted rank possible, that of Chief Master Sergeant in our Air Force. And lastly and most importantly, please welcome our Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant Joanne Bass. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Can y'all hear me on this mic? Okay. I have a lapel mic if y'all want to turn that on. Let me know. Test, test. Oh, now y'all can hear? All right, good stuff. So, hey, how was today? Good stuff. So, lap dogs. <laughs> so how many of y'all know Dave Wade? Like, like, he is actually seriously a lap dog. First time he came to my house, like I have two lap dogs, by the way, JB and Grace. One, one I bought in Germany, the other one in France. JB's name was Juby New, and so we're like, man, we got to call him JB. But anyway, they jumped all over Dave Wade, and I thought, you know, Dave, it looks a little intimidating, and he doesn't look like a lap dog person, right? I mean, but, but he loves them. We've got pictures with them, with it. And let me tell you, like, Dave Wade, it, 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 let me tell you something about this entire group, like, that we make each other better, and, and, and we have some great verbal sparring when we're together that I'm so determined that the next time we do some verbal sparring, JB and Grace are going to be with you. So that way, like everything will work out. So hey, um, we, I don't know, we might get out of here on time, 1730. We'll see. I, ha I have some things, um, pro tips, as Dave Wade actually likes to say, that I want to share with you guys. And none of these are in any particular order. Over the past three days that I've been with you guys, I've been taking a whole lot of notes. And so I have some pro tips that I want to share with you from all the stuff that we've unpacked. Um, hey, we've got to lead by example. Like there were a lot of notes to be taken. If you spend time looking at your senior leaders, they all have notes. Like we need to, and, and it's interesting to me because oftentimes when I'm on the road and have lunch with some of our airmen, our NCOs, they roll into there without a notepad. So we got to lead by example, chiefs. Like if you don't have a notepad, you need to get one. I get it, we're in the information age, maybe you're taking notes on the phone, go ahead and take notes on the phone, but your airmen will watch you. So we, we got a whole lot of things. And remember we talked about that learning curve? Like, I think for most of us, these last three days, it already started. So lead by example, make sure that your folks are taking notes. Thinking force. So you've got to, you know, we, we, we talked about that a lot on day one. We gotta be a thinking force but you're gonna to have to give yourself time to think. General Mattis at the time, ret retired Secretary Mattis, said the single, best, the single biggest problem of senior leadership in the information age is the lack of reflection. So you are gonna to have to dig deep and make sure that you put it in your battle rhythm to have times of solitude so that you can actually just think. I think if you talk to most of your senior leaders, they will tell you that they are deliberate about putting thinking time in their battle rhythm. I think every night, and then I think every morning. Well, you know, I suppose we should think more, but that solitude time, I guard it with everything so that I can think about where we need to go as an organization. Um, the information war. We talked a lot about that on day one as well how it controls the people. And I'll offer that if we lose an information, we lose period. Y'all really need to think about that. Think about the things that Sergeant Denton spoke to you about World War Web. I'll be honest with you, when it comes to social media and the information age, I was a little bit of a novice when I first got in the seat. When I first got in the seat, and, and, and let me tell you a little bit about, infra we'll talk about social media a little bit. When I first got in the seat, I didn't even know what a troll was. 
How many of y'all know what a troll was? How many of y'all did not? I'm the only one. <laughs> so I get in the seat, maybe about seven weeks in, eight weeks in. Sur you know, Surgeon Denton calls me up, and oh, by the way, I have a PA who does all my social media, so it's not me online. But I do clap back, so when I, do, when I drop the bomb, it's normally me. But anyway, <laughs> so that's normally me, and I'll let Jared know. But anyway, I didn't even know what a troll was. Jared calls me up and says, hey, Chief, you got a bunch of trolls on your site. Trolls? What's a troll? And then he said, you have swarms of them. I'm like, what? Like, do these people work? And they're all intel. And I said, that figures. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So what I will tell you is, like, we're in this information age, y'all. Like, but we are going to have to learn about that controlling information piece. I think they talked about it also on day one, where China is investing into media outlets across the globe. Why? To control information, to control the narrative. There are several books out there. I have some of them on my reading list that you all probably need to get familiar with. Like War is one of them. Um, but there are lots of things out there. We ha if we lose in information, we lose. It's a, it's a real thing. And I would also, uh, well, let me wait till we get to design. Um, when it comes to strategic competition, we got to play the long game. That long game we spoke about a little bit on day one, too. And you heard the term whole of nation approach. And you'll hear that more. We also talked about control what you can control, right? We're the United States mil military, we're the United States Air Force. We can control those, you know, we've got to control what we can control. But you will start to hear the whole of nation piece a whole lot more. If you want to know more about that, I'm going to offer that you need to read the kill chain. It'll start to help you explain and help you understand and communicate this whole of nation approach. Any adversary that we have is not playing the short game and they're not interested in beating the Air Force. Their focus is on how do we make sure that again, we can get to a period of rejuvenation so that we can be our very best, but we have to play that long game as well. And so it's with that um, that I'm focused. Did you guys get your book under your marathon? When? Y'all give a hand clap to Air University for making sure that you guys have that. And in that whole of nation approach, you know, we spoke about, I think it was KP who spoke about friends, partner nations, trade partners, and how relationships matter. I'll tell you, some of you guys are in positions now, whether you're in um, the Pacific area or in USAFE AF Africa, where you have opportunities to spend time with our partner nations. Again, that's part of playing the long game. General Brown spends time with his air chiefs playing the long game to help build those partners up. We have, in fact, Chief Select Gary, where were you at? Is Gary here? Gary's right there. So he's, he spends time focused on how can we cultivate our relationships with our partner nations. You know, we can be big critics sometimes in the Air Force and talk about the things that we don't do well in the Air Force, but there's a whole lot of stuff that the United States Air Force does well. And I know it because I spend time with our partner nations. You know, in fact, it was last fall when we brought 45 or 44 partner nations, my equivalents, chief master sergeants of 44 nations, into um, San Antonio, Military City USA, so we can talk about developing leaders. Because if we're the smallest Air Force we've ever been, if we've got peer threats, if we've got threats across the globe, we can't do this thing by ourselves. We have to grow other partner nations. We have to grow their enlisted corps. Relationships matter. In fact, it's through those relationships that we have with our partner nations that, that both Ben Hedden and um, and Dave Wolf are cultivating, it's those relationships that will grow those partner nations for a bigger purpose than just sometimes we're focused on. In fact, those relationships, Diamond One was spending time talking with a few of the other partner nations on bilats, talking to them about the value of a first sergeant, 
Most of them don't even have a first sergeant construct. And so a few of them were like, we need some first sergeants. Let's help grow their nation. So anyway, um, action order D, design implementation. While I might spend most of my time in action order A for airmen, action order D is the one that I get most excited about. And I hope y'all do too. Design implementation. We have an opportunity today to really think about that as an Air Force. If we could change the way we're designed to be able to compete against China or Russia, would we do it? If we had, to, if we had an opportunity to really think deep today, we, in whatever position you're in, would we change the way we're designed at a squadron level, group level, flight level, functional community level? Would we change the way we're designed? Our processes, our policies, our organization, our structure. General Brown has tasked us to look at those things. Are we willing to do it? I'll tell you to our career field managers, when I spent time talking to them, I gave them the warning order. I'm like, I need you to focus on the future. I need you to focus on the long game. What's our Air Force look like in 2030 and beyond? And how do we get there? I'd offer to you that we have too many AFSCs. And there's some AFSCs that we don't even have built yet. Those AFSCs that we don't yet have, that we need in the future, are probably in our cyber and our information domain. And possibly even psychological operations. We've got to grow that. We can't keep doing the same stuff that we've been doing, but action order D, are you willing to help get after it? Culture. We talked a whole lot about that today. How many of y'all spent time in ATC? How many is a tech training instructor? MTL, MTI. So y'all know what I'm talking about. How many of y'all actually have been to a BMT graduation in the last three years? I don't know if it's like this during COVID, ET, but before COVID, I mean, they played Lee Greenwood. How many of y'all heard Lee Greenwood at BMT graduation? I don't remember Lee Greenwood when I graduated. Like, I mean, yeah, Nat, so listen. <laughs> But if you've been to a BMT graduation in the last three years, like, I mean, they know how to get into that effective domain, right? I mean, it's almost like you're on a Hallmark commercial. Everybody's crying. Like, people are crying at BMT. Lee Greenwood's playing. Like, it's a significant emotional event. But to our airmen, it's like the best day of their life. Their commitment level is high. If you've been to graduation, I'm serious, commitment level is high. They are excited to be part of the 1%. For whatever reason they came and served, doesn't matter. Excited to be part of the 1%. Then they go to tech training. For the most part in tech training, that commitment level is still going to stay high unless they sit around and don't do anything and don't have a sense of purpose. That's on the exception. For the most part, high commitment level at BMT, high commitment level at tech training, then what happens? They enter your formations. That culture is what either makes or breaks. That culture, and I would offer it's not even a squadron commander, squadron chief, like that's not it. It's that flight level, first line supervisor, that section it's that culture that's gonna be the deciding factor of that commitment level, high, excited to be part of the 1%, or that says, man, I can't wait to get out here. You all control that. So just think about that commitment level. Um, real quick, hey, when I made chief, I'll never forget, one of the first phone calls I got, I was stationed in Germany at the time, Marty Klukas called me up. Anybody know Marty Klukas still? Marty Klukas called me up. We were stationed together in the 2-4. And he's like, freaking congratulations, you know, boom, boom, boom. And the first thing he said to me, and we hadn't talked in a long time, first thing he said to me, don't ever let your PT be bad. So I would offer to some of you guys, 
Don't ever let your PT be bad. That's part of that leading by example. You've got to do it, your chief. Um, you know, General Brown talked about don't burn a bridge, right? Maybe you don't cross it, but don't burn a bridge. Our Air Force is too small. Our joint force is too small. That's where that emotional intelligence comes in. This is your peer group, don't ever burn a bridge. Um, I think I heard somebody say, you don't have to tell your boss everything. I actually agree with that, but I communicate a whole lot with my boss. What I communicate my boss, what I communicate to my boss, and this still holds true to General Brown, I communicate a whole lot with him to make sure that he's aware of stuff. But what I don't do is take him the problems that I can solve. So I would ask you guys to really think about that. When you're talk when are you giving your boss stuff that, that you can do? Like I never do that. In fact, the only stuff I take to General Brown sometimes that I can solve is just as a matter of like cause and effect. Most of the time I handle everything because I need him to focus on the things that he needs to focus on. Every once in a while I'll share some things um, that he needs to know out of embarrassment. Like 80% of your force goes and takes a number two pencil to promotion test. You need to know that, sir, because when I need you to find some money for us, I need you to do that. But otherwise, never take your boss um, things that you can handle. Airman's time, how many of y'all had heard that concept before? How many of you guys are doing airman's time right now? I love it. You're empowered to get after it. You're probably gonna see a dual SIG memo that comes out within the next few months from me and General Brown that says, hey leaders, like give your airmen time to be able to be the NCOs that they need to be, to be the senior NCOs that they need to be, but don't wait on us. Like give your folks time to be able to be the folks that they need to be. Um, IQ can help you go so, so far in life. You're going to need EQ for the rest. And so great, good job on Chief Booth for sharing a whole lot about EQ. I'm almost down to the last bits. Good leaders help people do well at work. Great leaders help people do well in life. Think about that for a minute. Good leaders help people do well at work. Great leaders help people do well in life. We talked about climate. I loved and I appreciated that all throughout today, they talked about the difference between climate and culture. And I learned a long time ago, in fact, while I was in one of the joint organizations, that the greatest thing you can bring with you as a leader is a, is a climate where every person can be their very best. I heard one of the senior mentors, I think, talk about climate. You set the stage on what, what you accept at work, you set that climate of no discrimination, no sexual assault, no this or no that. Bring with you a good climate. A climate where every airman can reach their full potential. And while doing that, one thing I wanna say, you know, people always ask me, especially those who are no longer in our service anymore, always ask me, are we becoming a, a, a soft Air Force? Are we becoming a soft force? And I would offer, we're not. We want a culture and a climate where every airman can be their vet best. But we also have to hold the line. And I need airmen to under leaders to make sure that we're holding the line and holding the standard. At the end of the day, we have to remember this is an all volunteer force. We're a profession of arms. I don't need leaders to wait for chiefs to, to come do it or first sergeants. We've got to hold the line. We've got to hold each other accountable and we've got to be able to expect the best. With that, I think we have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm gonna open it up to questions. If I don't have the answer, I'm sure that some of these folks do questions and answers. So if you have some questions and answers for myself or the senior mentors, I'd love to open it up for about 15 minutes. Morning, Chief. Morning, Chief morning. Simeon. This week morning. we've got loaded with a lot of information and we see a lot of changes coming, right? 
And I'm asking, is there a consolidated maybe time chart to kind of give me a, give us a head start of what's coming next or even bite-sized pieces of what's coming next so that when it comes down, we can get in front of it and produce the right message that we're trying to cultivate to our airmen? Yeah. You got one hand clap. <laughs> Hey, I'll share a few things with you guys. Um, what I will tell you is this. Your MAGCOM chiefs are tracking all the things that we're trying to get after. And I think I shared with you all when I first started talking, we have this things to get after list. And I'll share some of those that we think we're going to be able to get after in 22. Um, the other thing that I'm going to say before I share this is I hear it all the time. Every time I go visit an organization and have dinner with the chiefs, the chiefs are always like, how come we always have to find something out on Facebook? Here's, here's what I'm going to tell y'all. Like, we can push stuff out on, this is the information age people, we can push stuff out on email, we can push it out on APAN. In fact, I, I do that often. The minute I push it out, I will clock my watch, and in 30 minutes, it's on Airmen and CO page. Like, it's a fact. We try to notify our chiefs. In fact, it was, I think, last fall, General Brown pushed a note to the wing commanders. I pushed a note to all the wing command chiefs and the CFMs. And within two hours, it was on Airmen and CO page. And it wasn't General Brown's APAN message. It was my message. So that's the challenge we're in. But there is nothing that we're, not, that we're making in a vacuum that you shouldn't probably be that demanding, like, chief. I know when I was at a group, I felt like I didn't get a whole lot of information at the group. So guess what I did? I hit my wing command chief up like, hey, I know you're getting fed information. As a wing command chief, if you're not getting information, you need to be hitting up your NAF chiefs and so on and so forth. But these folks will share a lot of the things that we're getting after. Um, we're going to push out a blueprint in a few months. I think you guys heard uh, Chief Blaze talking about that. We're getting after some EPME reform. I don't want to get in AU and ATC's lane, but one of the th we actually ask for two do outs on that. One is, are what we're teaching in PME today, is it relevant? And let's do some deep diving to make sure that what we're teaching in PME is relevant today. So we're doing some reform there, but then also what's PME in the future look like? What does enlisted education look like in 2030? We're doing some homework and we'll do some pilots on that. Um, we'll push out a new brown book. How many of y'all love your brown book? How many of y'all want an updated brown book? How many of y'all want hard copy? I know. So we're going to make sure that it's hard copy and digital, but we're changing the look of the brown book. It'll still be a brown book, but we're making it more relevant and applicable to today. So we'll roll that out this year. We'll probably get after a blue book as well. I, I think we've got that in the run. Um, and we're going to make some DSD changes. Developmental special duty. There's nothing special about 10 things under there. We've got to do a facelift, so we'll make some changes to that. We'll roll that out. But what the intent is that we show that we value those who are, who are currently recruiting this next generation of airmen, those who are building this generation of airmen, and those who are developing this gener generation of airmen. And we'll show that through a competitive process where it'll probably be a centralized board. So we'll make some changes on DSD. Um, trying to get digital WAPS testing passed across the line. We'll get the narrative piece passed across the line too. Um, you know, I, I, I pushed in here, I'm trying to, we're trying to get after a complete redesign in the ES. If we could honestly maybe blow it up and just start over, that'd be my preferred choice. Not because I think it's broken, I just don't think it's optimal for what we need in 10 years from now. And if I could start over, we probably would, but we can't. We're gonna have to be smart about the changes that we're gonna make, but we're gonna make some changes to EES. I don't think the way we currently do evaluations, again, is optimal for 2030. I don't think the way we currently look at WAPs as a promotion standard is necessarily what we want in 2030. So we're gonna have an evolution of how we get there. I spend a lot of time actually talking to the former Chief Master of the Air Force too because I want to understand sometimes their thought process on what, how we got to where we got to on certain things. 
And when I talk to most of them about WAPS, they're like, yeah, we want to make some changes, but it was a big lift, right? And I'm like, well, thanks, because now I got to make those changes, right? But, but, but it's timing and it's system challenges that we have. But we may look at something like that. I do a whole lot of spitballing with this group. We do a whole lot of spitballing thinking about what is best for the force. We'll see. I'll actually throw some stuff out there because I want to know your thoughts. Like, what do y'all think if we pull out of the evaluation anything that's not job related? What do y'all think? How many of y'all want to keep stuff that's outside of job related? It's, it's tough, right? I don't know. I have mixed review. We all, we, we kind of have some different review, mixed reviews on that. But these are things like we're thinking about. Personally, Joe Bass, I actually just want to get us down to a one page EPR. I mean, I think we can figure this out. I'm also a little bit simple, you know, when it comes to the evaluation too. I feel like the five rating thing is just a little bit too complicated. Just my opinion. I'm kind of a simple person, like, give me three things. Like, does not meet, meet, succeeds. So, a few of y'all like that. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll make some um, tweaks in that area. Talent management, I think I told you all, talent marketplace for senior NCOs. We're trying to get that across the line this year. And we're looking at leadership assessments too. I asked Diamond One to look at a leadership assessment for our first sergeants. And I actually want leadership assessments for our chiefs too. I feel like if you are entrusted to lead airmen in certain positions, then there is more than just what your EPR shows and we ought to have an assessment on that. And more importantly, it should be for your own self-development. So we're gonna look at pushing out some assessments. General Brown talked a little bit about that. There's a whole lot of policy changes we're trying to work. Um, like I mentioned, we have like, how, how many, DC was here talking about how many 90 something enlisted assignment recommendations they're pushing for. So we're trying to make some policy changes on that, trying to get after stuff that's free. I'm actually okay with base swaps, you know? Five level here, five level there, they wanna swap. It's not gonna cost us anything, who cares? Like, Figure it out. So we'll look at some things like that. Um, secondary caregivers, they talked about. Continuation board, as DC talked about. We'll roll that out too. Um, I think that's about all the big things. Am I missing anything? Big things we're going to push out? All right. Thanks for that question. We have about five minutes, ma'am. All right, five minutes. Good evening, ma'am. Senior Donathan, 96 Test Wing. So hopefully I'm not wasting you all's time with this question, but uh, spending time in PACAF and USAFE, I was always curious about airmen getting stationed for their first time in these high ops tempo locations. Yep. Still yet to figure out if they can conform to military standards. We spend a lot of time, resources, and everything like that. Where has any consideration been put into maintaining first term, excuse me, not first term, but first assignments at CONUS locations, getting them qualified, making a five-level requirement for high op tempo locations, Korea, USAFE, Germany, things like that, when we're looking at the future years and how we want to reshape the enlisted structure. Thank you for your time. So I know in theory we've talked about it, right? We're like, hey, Korea is not the place. You know, you heard Todd Simmons say, don't go to Korea until you're mature, right? I don't know that that's the answer. I'm going to defer to Dave Wolf. Are y'all thinking about it? There's a couple of, uh, couple of problems with that. I mean, obviously, if you uh, take away all of the ability for your overseas people to supervise young people, uh, you're, you're losing out on, a, on an opportunity for your NCOs uh, to be able to do that. But I will tell you, we are considering at a couple of different locations uh, in PACAF, there's, there's, a, there's some data that suggests that there's some locations where uh, folks first term that have families already, which is becoming a lot more prevalent than maybe it was when we first came in. I mean, everybody I was in basic training with, there was like one married guy, we called him grandpa because he was 23, right? Uh, that's, that's not really the case nowadays, right? This is kind of more the norm. 
Uh, so I think that we'll, uh, we'll take a look at some of those policies, but um, I think when you, when you start talking about a wholesale change like that, that's a pretty big muscle movement that would have a lot of second and third order effects that we would have to study pretty hard before we made a decision like that. Cool. All right. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> also say, too, from, uh, like, if you're a CONUS, like Air Combat Command or AETC, AMC, that puts the burden on training all those three levels to make them five levels so they can come overseas. That, that's a big burden. We went through that during, during COVID when we weren't sending any uh, first term, like any airman straight out of tech school overseas, and we were maxing out all our dorms, and all of a sudden you have 14 brand new airmen show up at your base, all in upgrade training. So that's a big onus to put on the CONUS units, and that would be one thing I would, I would say, even, even though even though that would really benefit me and you, Safey, and all, and all my folks out of here from you, Safey, it sounds like a great idea. But enterprise-wide, probably not such a great idea. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, Chief. Uh, Chief Edmonds from uh, Travis Air Force Base. My question is about uh, the primary and secondary caregiver leave. I believe right now the AFI uh, allows the member to decide whether they are primary caregiver. I guess two-part question. Uh, is it possible to have like specific situations? We have some cases where uh, the military members, active duty, obviously their spouse is civilian, no issues with the pregnancy or anything like that, but yet they want to take the primary caregiver, which I can argue both ways, but it doesn't really specify in there. And then the second part is with the 12 weeks, which is around 84 days, and 18 weeks, which is 126 days, has there been any discussion at all on maybe possibly removing the EPR requirement when those members go on that long of a break, I guess, from the military? Um, for the first one, I'll be honest. I actually prefer our AFIs to be less prescriptive. You know, I, I feel like that's a leadership thing and that leaders need to make the right decisions. However, let me take that one back to the team to find out are we having challenges where our leaders aren't being leaders and it's forcing people, right, like, and we're not making the right decision. So I'll take that one back to the team. Um, but when it comes to AFIs, again, I'm like, leaders need to be leaders and make right decisions. Everything's not going to be codified in an AFI. Um, on the other piece, I think, it, can it be non-rated time? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Yeah, okay. So, so I think it's already in there. It's not rated time. We're, we're probably going to go for the EPR again, and DC gave you all a, sh a, a bit of a tweak to that. And if we can get down to one page, like, it's going to be a non-issue. You know, you're going to, whatever you did during the rated time that you had, you're going to put it in there. It's not going to look the way it did in the past. All right. Chief Senior Solis from Hickam. What are your thoughts on frocking? If with regards to messaging, as we move forward, some of us select PCS showing up with the chief already on the chest. Yeah, I just frocked um, somebody, I think, last week. So, yeah, we just frocked somebody. I think it depends on the situation. So you'll take that through your major command, and they'll push it up my way. I think it depends, right? Not every organization needs to have somebody frock. To some of our joint organizations, it matters more than not. Like, I don't have an issue with frocking. So push that up your chain. Senior Aaron Candida Air Base. Uh, secondary caregiver leave. I'm, currently, the AFI only allows a person to take secondary or ordinary leave after secondary caregiver leave. So members can't go on ordinary leave with the anticipation that they're gonna, their, their spouse is going to have a baby. Is there any thoughts of changing that to allow members to take ordinary leave ahead of secondary caregiver leave? I'm gonna have to phone a friend on that one. Do you do you want do y'all understand the questions? I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. So you're saying that you can't take your ordinary, or you have to take your ordinary leave and your second care, secondary caregiver leave, caregiver leave, because there one is chargeable, one is non-chargeable. Correct. That, that's correct. So currently, the AFI states it clearly states a member cannot take ordinary leave prior to starting their secondary leave. They would have to come back to work then start their secondary. For, so for an example, if a member Copy. is at a base and their, their spouse is at another location. Copy. Yeah, so the reason for that is because just like with any other passes, so you got to remember that the leaves are congressional, right? So it's a, it's a certain reason that we take leaves. And the whole point is to not have you out for an extended amount of time. It's an accountability issue. But commanders do have certain leverages and authorities to put you in certain statuses to help along with that. So 
we had that conversation, I believe, was with the Army and uh, some others. And what they've said is, hey, look, the, the authorities exist for your commanders to make some decisions based on what works for you. So in other words, you can very well do that if, that, if the intent needs to happen, where someone's on leave and you can change the status and then you can go and start your leave or your secondary caregiver leave uh, in conjunction with, but we got to be careful to meet the intent of the AFI. So commanders have some leverage and authorities there. I can see from your eyes, I don't think that satisfies your need. I'll follow so, up with you. Let's, so, we can talk one-on-one, so, one let's, one one, so let's I'll make sure I understand afterward. the question. All right, teammates, hey, I think we have some folks that we want to recognize that were responsible for putting this event on. And so where, where are the folks who helped make this event possible? All right, y'all come on down. The first one out the gate would be a Sergeant Watson. A Sergeant Watson, he has. Just that one, everybody else has one. Okay. There has not been. Congratulations. Thanks for everything. All right, y'all get on up here. All right, we hooked you up already oh, we're good before? To go, yep, I love yep. that, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, awesome, thank you thank very you, much. Don't thank drop you. this now. I got it, yes ma'am. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks thank Bassett, you, appreciate you. All right Evans, thank you yes, so much. You, All right, thanks so much. Thanks so much Marsha. Ooh, look at you two coins. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Very cool. All right. <laughs> She's like, I'm not dropping it. Chief killed it. All right. Thanks so much, Chief. All right, y'all give him one more hand clap. We'll get a picture later. Did he just drop his coin? Oh, it's going to be an expensive night for Linder. Okay, look, did you just drop your coin? I'm coming to Randy's office. Oh, very good. He said he's coming to Chief Kwiatkowski's. All right. I had some beer I needed to buy him, so you can buy it. Uh, all right. So real quick, hey, as we get ready to close out what I think is an amazing three days, and you guys all go off to spend some time with your major command, um, command chiefs and your fellow teammates in your major command, um, I hope you can reflect back on these last three days and, and you know, take this back and pour into your airmen, pour into your organizations. Um, one quote I'll leave you with that I always keep in my binder to just keep me grounded. And it reminds me that success, success usually comes to those who are too busy to look for it. So if you just stay focused and busy, man, don't worry about like where that next job is gonna be. Or don't worry about like, to, you know, I know we've grown up, and, and I remember somebody saying, you know, you ought to be thinking two jobs ahead. No, that wasn't my MO. Like, success usually comes to those who are too busy. We got a whole lot of things for you guys to get after. With that, on behalf of my husband, Ron, um, myself, please go home and tell your families thank you. Make sure they, that they know how much we appreciate everything that they do. They serve so that you can serve. So please give our family, um, families your thanks. And with that, it's an honor to serve with you guys. And we look forward to seeing you in your formations. Awesome. Thanks, guys.